So it is uh, Tuesday, May 23rd, 5.39 p.m., and we'll call this joint meeting of the Ordinance and Charter Change Committees uh, to order. Um, uh, I am co-chairing this committee, Ben Travers, with Councilor Bergman. We also have with us here this evening from um, the Charter Change Committee, uh, Councilor Doherty online, uh, and Councilor Carpenter um, from the Ordinance Committee. Uh, we have Councilor Hightower as well. Uh, I know Councilor Shannon is out of town and um, will not be here this evening, but Kim, appreciate your recording the meeting as I know Councilor Shannon will want to tune into it. I think, um, you know, based on our last meeting, um, the meeting planned for this evening, as well as the meeting on the 30th, um, are largely intended still as uh, information gathering meetings. Um, we have an agenda which we'll turn to uh, approving momentarily, but uh, it begins with a uh, slightly deeper overview of some of the documents that are before the committee that Councillor Bergman will run us through. Uh, we're expecting um, HR Director, Director Karen Durfee uh, to come and provide a presentation on uh, discipline and appeals process for other uh, city municipal employees. And um, we will then turn to a review of uh, the CNA report and Talitha consultants and their recommendations. Councillor Hightower, I know that you may be available to uh, provide some feedback on that, and uh, we may have Councillor uh, Paul in attendance for that too. Uh, that's just a general overview, though, of the meeting. Uh, I think the expectation is at the end of each of our agenda items, if there's any uh, public comment or questions, rather than our having a, a dedicated public comment period up at the beginning, we'll have an opportunity for public comment after each of our agenda items and ask that folks, uh, at least from my perspective, um, keep their comments and questions uh, specific to, to the agenda item. But of course, as we go through the draft proposals and documents before the committee, that, that's pretty broad. Uh, so I think that would be a good opportunity for uh, general public comment as well. Uh, so with that overview, I think the first item on our agenda is uh, the adoption of the agenda. Is our motion to adopt the agenda? I'll move. Is there a second? And I would second that. Okay. Uh, all in favor, any further discussion on the agenda? All in, sorry, Councillor Hightower. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. No. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, that's unanimous. And next item on our agenda is the adoption of our minutes from our May 4th meeting. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the minutes from May 4th? I would move that or? I'll second. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion on the minutes? All in favor of approving our May 4th minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Um, which takes us to item 3.01, which is uh, a review of, of the draft proposals that are before the committee. And um, for that, Councilor Bergman, I understand that you have uh, prepared a, a little bit of a, a deeper synopsis. I know that we would be here for quite some time if we took a deep, deep dive on each of the items, but. I'll turn the floor to you. Yes, uh, you will see a lot of documents on the um, posted on board docs, and it would really take several meetings of many hours to go through each one and then get public comments. So let me just say that first, the charge of the committee has been, according to the resolution that created us, uh, looking at the ballot initiative that just failed the charter amendment that was proposed by the administration on December 7th uh, 2020 and then the council's uh, October 18th 2021 um, resolution and the associated ordinance proposal and we're to do this for a robust uh, review and you will see on that are po that it's posted those documents that I've just referred to are posted um, on there. And so that's what we're gonna do. I decided that it would make, make sense since we're talking about oversight and oversight involves, if we look at what the NACOL um, format is, is it involves both investigatory uh, function, uh, investigatory function, and that is the discipline process it also includes reviewing and auditing and monitoring they sort of use those they're somewhat different but they're fairly well lumped together into a different way of looking at them so 
when we look at the documents that we have on our agenda today and we look at it from the standpoint of the, investiga the investigative function of a community oversight body, you will see that the uh, December 7th, 2020 Mayor's Memo on Charter Change, on the Charter Change Committee's proposal, and then the Mayor's proposed Charter Change in that has an investigatory function uh, on the, in the, that PDF on pages three through six. So if you're looking to sort of like, okay, what I'm gonna put these things in the baskets, that document you can look at for the mayor's proposed charter change at that time um, for the investigative function on PDF pages three through six. The next document is a February 9th, 2022 draft ordinance. Uh, it's called Draft Ordinance Police Commission Oversight. And if you look at um, that document, part five, which is found on the PDF pages five through six, is where the, investiga the investigative function is located. Um, and then there's another document which has, uh, which is from April 4th, April, no, April 20, April 22nd, 20, uh, 2022. It's a police commission memo and a draft um, a, and related to the draft ordinance with their comments. And pay, the part five, which is about investigation and, and discipline, is found on page 12 of that document. We've got several other documents that seem fully within that function. The uh, I'm just going to read it, the 2022, uh, October 20th, Citizens Complete Process Flowchart is the department's flowchart on citizen complaints. The 2023, January 26th, Use of Force Flowchart is the department's flowchart on the use of force. Those are all clearly within the context of um, discipline. The 082520 uh, Burlington Police Commission policy on the role of the commission in the review of complaints against employees is also related to this function. And finally, the 101821 signed council resolution on the police oversight and accountability, um, the, the a very foundational um, resolution. Um, th in that document, lines 78 through 90 and 106 through 111 are where the investigative functions are located. So there are three other documents that relate very, very specifically to the vetoed and um, defeated ballot items, those two items. Uh, that is the December 6, uh, 2020 police commissioner's comments on the draft charter changes, charter change committee's proposal for civilian oversight of police. Then the December 31st, 2020 mayor's veto of that oversight proposal. And then the uh, March 7th, 2023 revised official copy of the official charter change. So you can see the veto message, you can see the police commission's comments on that earlier proposal from the charter change committee, and then you can see what was just voted on and was defeated um, this past March. And that, those are the documents that relate to investigations. Uh, and then there are three documents that relate to the auditing and monitoring and review function. Uh, the uh, 020922 draft ordinance of the police commission of uh, police commission oversight, except for part uh, XX5, which was found on, uh, like I said, pages five and six, and then the the. The other, the, 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 planning, the, the police commission's memo 
has their comments on everything and most of that, those two documents relate to the auditing, monitoring and review function. And then finally, you've got the, uh, the resol that resolution from October 18th, uh, 2021 and the resolve clauses uh, in s lines 63 through 77, 90 through 95 and 103 through 105 deal with this auditing, monitoring, and review function. So you can see that the documents that we've got cover the full panoply of the functions uh, that a, a, a community oversight body would have um, with their police department. And um, I invite folks to look over them. I'm sure that we will delve into some of them but I will spare you trying to do that because this was enough of a mouthful. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gene. I think that that was a good review. I think, again, just as a reminder to folks, um, uh, this tonight's meeting actually, unfortunately, has a conflict with the police commission's meeting, and so we don't have representatives from the police commission here tonight, but we do have them coming in at our meeting on May 30th to, as a body, provide feedback on um, some of the documents you just went over. I'm mindful of the fact that the draft ordinance and, and the police commission's response to that draft were from uh, that group of the police commission from uh, you know, last year, or 2021. Of course, there's a number of new members in the commission, so we'll look forward to hearing their feedback at our next meeting. Um, we do have a period of uh, public comment after each of our agenda items here, and, and then we'll turn to Director Durfee. Thank you for being here. Um, Karen, who no doubt will be able to provide s some further context and insight into how the different proposals that we've seen as a committee uh, play into <coughs> the existing uh, processes that are available, not only to <coughs> employees of the police department, but other municipal employees as well. Um, but Turning now to public comment, is there any member of the public, I suppose we'll look here in person first, that has any feedback or thoughts? We started this discussion at our last meeting, but we'll continue it now on some of the proposals that have been uh, put before the committee uh, or more general thoughts on the direction that they'd like the committee to go in. Um, yeah, go ahead. If you could just state your name again for the record. Yeah. Hello, my name is Dave Marr. I've lived in the Burlington area for nearly 50 years. This is my first time in this room. Kind of a cool room here. Just want to say that I appreciate your efforts to improve police oversight, but I urge you to pursue an approach, an approach that doesn't hinder effective policing. As you all know, we have a problem in Burlington, and I have to believe that it's at least in part due to the reduced size of our police force. Last year, in Burlington, we had five homicides and 26 gunfire incidents. I believe that's a record. We also have skyrocketing drug overdoses. So we need an oversight process that will help efforts to rebuild our police force so that they have adequate staffing to address these issues. And I think we need buy-in from the police department uh, into whatever oversight approach we end up pursuing. I think the best way to get buy-in is to involve the police department in developing and implementing this new oversight process. I previously recommended a peer review process within the police department as a first step in any disciplinary action. That's one approach, but there might be others that are equally good or maybe even better. Whatever process we pursue, we need input from the police department and we need to take that input seriously. That way, I think we can have a win-win situation with better oversight and more effective policing. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I suppose we'll go around for public comment, but then before we get off this agenda item, if there's any counselors in the committee that have any questions or comments with respect to the items, uh, we'll certainly go to the counselors on the committee as well. Um, but are there any other members of the public that have public comment at this point in time? Yep, Lee. 
And thank you very much to Channel 17, Town Meeting TV, for being here. Again, I live in Ward 7, uh, really excited about this process and taking public input. Um, so something I, I really think where a new oversight formula could be super helpful is in the issue of public trust or lack of trust with the police department. I think this is where a really well thought out oversight could be incredibly helpful. Um, I think a huge barrier to trust is <laughs> an element um, of the current model I think is a huge barrier to trust is regarding discipline because the only discipline we hear about is things that are so nuclear they 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 reach the public um, and I, so if that's if that's the only items that the public has to be able to to judge if they trust the disciplinary um, perspective of the chief. I mean, it's just kind of setting up, setting up both sides for failure. Um, I think it is just as important for the public to see, um, see engage, to see disciplinary outcomes that they feel good about, and there, there may be. A lot of those, you know, the negative ones or the ones people feel are inequitable may in fact be a very small percentage. And I think it would be helpful for whoever, whoever is chief, um, for the public to be able to, to gauge their assessment and appraisal of, of whether we're disciplines at with that. And I, you know, I think, so, so the argument to that is, um, uh, you know the the police union and and right to employee confidentiality with discipline and I, I think there's I don't think it has to be an all-or-nothing thing and I think there is a way to disaggregate or aggregate data in a way where you can inform the public of discipline and also still have it be anonymized to meet the police union and and the privacy that employees are entitled to, and I just think there's a creative solution. I, th I think it's totally possible, and I just think um, I would really like to see more transparency around discipline outcomes. I really don't think you can realistically have a lot of public trust without it. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so we're in public comment right now on generally some of the proposals that are here before the committee. Yeah, Romeo. If we could turn to you now, that would be great. Thank you. Um, my name is Romeo. I am a Ward 8 resident. I also work for Green Mountain Transit and uh, do have a almost daily interaction with uh, law enforcement for them to uh, who respond to our help when we need them the most. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say and the best, uh, not necessarily the best, but the best way to have a a you know, decent oversight uh, body is to have it, an oversight that is separate, independent, that is able to make a decision without having to worry about them being looked over their shoulders all the time, uh, provide adequate resources that can uh, help uh, and alleviate the fact that we don't have uh, the research that's not available to that specific department. Also, access to critical pieces that is needed to resolve any outstanding issues for that specific uh, oversight uh, future uh, agency or uh, even the current police commission that we have if they end up taking that critical role down the line. Also, another thing that I was thinking was within the talent unfairness, having to recruit the right officers in the department. So that way that when oversight is done, that we have the right people who are leading the department, also working with the public directly. And as well as the ability to create a, a better trust format between the community and the public. So thank you. Thank you, Romeo. Uh, anyone else here in the Fletcher room with public comment? And then would be happy to turn to folks online as well. If you'd like to uh, um, give a public comment, please go ahead and use the raise hand function. Um, anyone else? We have Tim Sturdivant from the city attorney's office, yeah. 
I'm a future attorney myself. So I like to connect with my people. Um, my name is Karen. Um, people know me for a lot of things. Uh, the mayor knows me. The president knows me. Everyone knows me. Um, I'm known for being myself. But I'm also Miss Black Vermont back in the day. Um, so black women with crowns, that is a thing in Vermont. Um, I'm here for many things, but I guess we're talking just about the police, right? Okay, so Mirad, I know Mirad very well. Apparently the man is a cyclopedic mind. I told him all that, you know, he can quote Shakespeare allegedly. I would love to hear that. Anyways, um, my problem with John Mirad is that he is a man seeking power, because I don't know if that acting career has really done a lot on him. You know, he wasn't JC Mirad, like he wanted to be on the Hollywood stars, and now he's back here being cop. You know, he was on 90210, if you've seen the episodes, as cops, and now he's playing it in real life. And I just think that you're playing with people's real lives, so as long as you are reporting the truth, as long as he is not him and Mira are not doing this bromance, let's all stay in power. Um, you know, I do, I, I mean, I'm a pretty girl, so I don't fight. I like no violence. I prefer a f peaceful environment. You know, women, real women enjoy peace and quiet and serene, you know, serenity and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that for this, um, I guess this new wave that's happening in Burlington, this new wave that's happening in Vermont, this change, this freedom, this opportunity for growth that we'll look at people who really just want to seek how they can aid others and not how they can seek power, how they can seek how to show others that they're so great. Um, because those people will become like I predicted, who was his name, Del Pozo? Unforgettable man, a forgettable man, sorry. Anyways, Del Pozo, I predicted that he was gonna be gone by the facts. Everybody looked at me like I was crazy when I told him to resign, and then a couple years later, he was resigning. So when I told y'all he was crazy, no one listened to me, and now look at where we are. So I just think that we need to really start listening to people when they start saying their opinions, because sometimes, like, you know, everything I've said have come to life. Um, it's real. And then you guys, you know, realize you guys have problems in your police department and we're right out of the police department. So I'm willing to give John Murad a chance as long as it's not a power hungry grab. Anyone else? Thank you. And Sir? Just to note that it's really hard for us to hear some of the folks who are further away. Everybody who's turned our way, great. So like Ben, Sarah. Where's the I'll look right at you. Hey, Zara, you home? How's your tall, good looking husband or man? Nice to see you, girl. Can she see me? I want her to see me. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think. Oh, OK. Well, either. Did you hear me? Are the, are the Channel 17 microphones being fed into the Zoom, or is, the, is it just this microphone? Okay. Oh, OK. Maybe let's. Well, pretty much I was saying, Zora, that when you see the chief and the mayor kicking, uh, make sure it's not some power hungry thing that they have going on, that they're really. Oh, here I am. All right, great. Make sure it's not some power hungry. I'm a little, the, there's black people here. Got to get some light. Anyways, um, make sure it's not a power hungry thing and it's real desire, real intention to aid others, real intentions to see what is the need in the community and not just, hey, I had power and this acting career now I no longer have power, but I want to sustain power. And that means we all have to suffer because of that. We don't want that. And that's the way to shorten up what I said. But go back and listen to it again, because it was worth listening to. Thank you. Thank you. Who did I give this to? Well, let's see. Is there anyone else here in the Fletcher Room of well, Public Bruce, Can you say something? No. I guess I OK, great. And then we'll, I, I, OK, great. Uh, I don't think there's anyone else at this point in time that's public comment. I see online, Andy, you, you have your hand raised. If you want to go ahead and just unmute yourself. Thank you. online with a public comment, then we can turn back to the counselors on the committee. Please go ahead and use the raise hand function if you have a comment. Okay, um, while we're still on this agenda item, which is 
uh, sort of the number of proposals over the last couple of years that have uh, wound up before this committee. Do any counselors have any questions or comments or thoughts at the moment with um, direction as to where we go from here on those proposals? Uh, personally, I think I'll have more thoughts after we've sort of heard from some of the other folks that are here, particularly after we hear from the police commission at our next meeting on the 30th, but certainly I think any comments that folks have now would help uh, potentially guide the discussion going forward from here. So I don't know if any, any counselors have any comments or questions right now. Sarah? This is more on the question side, and I, I, um, I'm looking at the flow chart. I don't know who produced it. I think that is as it is, which we know has a lot of issues. But I just had, you've heard, we have heard reference, um, there's no internal affairs function, which I know some departments have, and I don't even know what that means. And I'm only just sort of sticking a pin in it because I would like. Oh, this is yours? Can we get an agenda? Uh, no, these are, I, I mean, it's not an agenda, but it's just stuff I printed off. Um, um, just because I don't understand what that function means, and people bring it up. The other thing at the sort of bottom of the flow chart is the mention of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. And again, I don't really know what that is. So again, stick a pin in it. I don't know that those are, either of those are things we want to pursue. I just need to understand what they are. Okay. Go to Tim. Tim or Yeah. Tim or Zariah, any comments at this point in time? Okay. Just Tim. I don't know. Tim, if you have any comment, Tim is. Just Tim is. Uh, no comments. Okay, okay. thanks. Jean? Um, for me, the proposal by the mayor on December 7th, 2020, is pretty different than the proposed ordinance uh, that was put forward on February 9th, 2022. And I would like for the commission to comment about that December um, 7th, uh, 2020 memo, as well as to hear comments about uh, the police commissions. We also have their comments about the charter change committees um, proposal that was vetoed. Uh, we have not gotten any comments about the proposal that went on the ballot by petition but, um, and, and, and was defeated. Um, but we do know that some commissioners, not the least of whom is now on the city council, um, Councillor Grant, um, supported the most recent um, uh, proposal that was on the ballot. And so I would, I hear we have on them on record for the, the initial um, proposal. It would be great to get reflections from the, com, uh, from the commission about the defeated um, proposal um, as well. And it's sort of wide open. Things that they liked about it or, or areas that need attention but they wouldn't do it in the same way. Things that they liked and would really like to have put in place. Things that they absolutely think was the worst thing since sliced bread. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, I like their, um, their reflections on that and that's a lot. And I know they're meeting tonight, and we are meeting again next week, so it may not be uh, possible for them to do it in one week, and I think that that is fine. But as we decide how to craft a change, their perspective, um, because it seems to me that there is a desire which would be, a, I think there's a majority desire to put all or most of the functions 
in the commission, whether it is as constituted now or in some other fashion. You know, maybe numbers would be changed, but um, given that, I think it would be really helpful to get folks to, to weigh in on those. Yep. Uh, I agree with that. I think there's uh, two things that I'm aware of that are happening at the police commission's meeting tonight. One is that I, I believe they are selecting a dedicated member or members uh, who will continuously and consistently come to this committee's meeting. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the police commission participating in that way. And the other, as mentioned before, is I, I do think a good chunk of our agenda on May 30th is going to be dedicated to uh, the police commission and their feedback on a number of the items that you've discussed there, Jane. I think absent objection from anyone else in this committee, I think um, in addition to what we've already relayed to them, I think it makes sense for us to uh, uh, relay to them specifically your wanting feedback on those items you just referenced. Unless, again, any counselor has any objection to that. Sorry, can we get the list of items again? I think, generally speaking, what we've already relayed to the police commission is that you know, we have their uh, memo that at least that version of the police commission had sent in response to the draft ordinance, and um, there, there's some understanding that they'll be here to uh, to speak on that and how, if at all, the commission has uh, shifted from the feedback that they gave at that point in time. Uh, the notes that I have here on what Gene raised are um, are sort of further directing them to provide feedback on um, uh, on the, the mayor's memorandum from December of, of 2020 and any position that they may have on the extent to which that memo differs from the ordinance that was then drafted by the city attorney's office. There's a proposed charter change. Uh, right. That was, was put out on the table that I would like to hear their comments about. And then um, to the extent they have it, uh, any reflections or feedback they have on uh, question seven in particular from the last town meeting day. Okay. Can I, I, do you mind if I have a comment as well? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I also just don't want us to get too theoretical on what's happened historically. Like ultimately, I guess, I'm sorry if I'm not hearing everything that everyone's saying. Like if the first thing we're talking about is investigatory authority, like I feel like just getting feedback on what that looks like um, rather than like the memo on this veto and the memo, like what they think about the ordinance. Like I don't think, I mean like that's fine, but ultimately I think we're probably gonna do something between, you know, the mayor's veto and the board that like just best investigatory authority within the police commission and leave everything else aside and you know the full blown proposal we had on the ballot or that was vetoed. Um, I, to some extent I feel like we're gonna we're looking for a, just like a somewhere between those two things for investigatory authority. And maybe that's the simpler way to phrase the question than um, maybe than doing a lot of feedback on things we in the past. I don't know if that's a fair way. I know that Gene's spent a lot of time on that, um, but I know that folks are aware of like, what that was, um, and I don't know that we need to get to the particulars rather than like, figure out. I'm just afraid we're going to spend too much time on debating the fine points of a lot of things that we're not going to ultimately really even go with. Understood. Um, Sarah, and then uh, once council comments are done, we'll turn to Councilor Grant and then Jordan, if that works. Okay. Um, I agree with Councilor Hightower. I think we could spend a lot of time looking backwards and we need to look forward. On the charter change in that particular memo, I, it's good to brush up on it, but it seems to me we first need to spend time on sort of the model process. We know, well, I shouldn't say we know, I believe we need a charter change at the end of the day and spending a lot of time on the words of a charter change before we know what we want to change. I just don't want us to spend a lot of time until we're agreed upon um, what we want to recommend. There's a big nut which is changing the chief's authority and we should have that conversation and then 
below it, and you'll know better than I do, are lots of nuts and bolts, but um, we need to agree on the big nut and then decide how much we want to spend now on words of the charter or get to the, the model or the process that we want. And then what do we got to change to make it happen? Gene, did you have something? Uh, yeah, oh, I, I mean, let me just say, my suggestion is not for them to go, you know, lot, to, to dissect it line by line. My is that there are big concepts in both of those documents that they should identify for us make sense or don't make sense and then let us know that um, and it's their reflections on those that are going to color so it's it it, it is that bigger concept in a way it's not a lot different than what you're suggesting Zariah but what it is doing is taking those specific ideas and getting their comments about them Right? Because at the end of the day, we got to come up with specific ideas for change. And we've heard new positions here. And, they, and, and, and so we want to be able to get their best understanding and position about these ideas that are out there. These are not ideas that because they're a, a year or two or were defeated a few months ago are like disappeared. They're, they're live ideas and maybe not in full cloth. I'm not suggesting that, but we ought to get their perspective on that, just like we're going to get their perspective on the draft ordinance. That, that's all I'm, all I'm asking, so not a, a line by line thing. Great. So, sorry, I've got one more comment. Just because I feel like I've seen, like, to some extent, I as much as like it was a painful process, I think the just conservation process was actually one of the best processes that we had in terms of getting to things just because very early on, we very quickly came to like, a, this is the draft language. And then we spent months arguing about it. And I would much rather we get to like, either like a list of like, here's the decision points we need to make, which I think is what you're getting at, Gene. But I would just be much, I would want us to be much more concrete about like, Here's what we're trying to make a decision on, like, okay, investigatory authority, A, B, C, D, like, who is invested with, like, what does that mean for us, like, what else do we have to change, like, to, you know, to start to have the outline, um, because I think we're underestimating how much time we're going to need to argue about it afterwards and to get public input about it afterwards, and to me, that's where the good work happens, that's where we get to compromise, that's where we get to, like, things that we didn't think about. And the longer we spent up front just being like, what are we talking about? Like, why are we talking about it? What should we, the less time we're gonna have to do the important work. And so the sooner we can get to, okay, here's the outline, of the authority, A, B, C, D, what are the points that we wanna make decisions on that need to be in the ordinance, the points that we need to make decisions on that are the charter change, the faster we will get to like, here's what we agree on, what we don't agree on, and the more public input we can get on what we don't agree on. And so, I'm, I know that I said this really last time, but I really want us to get to like, what do we agree on? Like, what are the things we're making decisions on? And what do we agree on so we don't even need to worry about it that much? And what do we disagree on? Because I feel like, again, in the disagreement and getting to agreement is where the, our best work is gonna be. And so, I'm, I caution us to be very, very clear on what we want input on. So I completely agree with everything that you've said here, Zoraya, and, and you know, based on my own review of the materials, I have my own thoughts on it. Uh, I'm eager to get to those decision points as well, but I'm also hard pressed to jump into that quite yet until we have the police commission here and an opportunity to hear from them probably at our next meeting. And so I think, I think my suggestion would be sort of after we hear from the police commission, and, and I agree we should ask them for sort of more specifics rather than sort of going on theoretically as to their thoughts on different pieces, as Gene put it, sort of what works from their perspective, what doesn't work from their perspective, um, to the extent they're able to speak to it as a body, and then, you know, maybe our committee has a more sort of direct agenda item at our next meeting to talk about exactly what you're talking about here, Zariah, which is sort of building out that question list. So if I, so I think this, I don't, I feel like I asked for this last time and maybe I wasn't. So if you, if Ben and Jane, as the two 
chairs can get together and I think make the outline of what we want decisions on before the place commission meeting. I would rather have them amend it and answer the points than us come up with it afterwards. So if we can, if you two can agree, and again, if anybody else can amend, what are decision points that we think they are, then at least I think we'll have a little bit of a clearer framework for discussion, a clearer framework for what our questions are. And I would want that before we bring in more folks. So like, yes, we should have the police commission at the next meeting, but I hope that you all can work on that and then present that to the police commission. And again, that's not exclusive then of anything else that you all maybe didn't put on it, but I think it's at least a, here's, here's what we're trying to do. I'm, I, if you're, if, I'm resistant to doing that before, in the next week and before I hear from the commission. I would like to hear from the commission. I would like this public process to happen. I'm more than happy because I think that Ben said uh, clearly, uh, which is we get the information from folks at least at this level and uh, then we can start to, to focus more. So um, I'm not adverse to doing that after that meeting. But I, 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 With all due respect, Gene, as a professional facilitator, you're wrong. Telling people, <laughs> I just want your feedback is not more helpful than telling them I want your feedback on this and getting it. Because it's fine, but that's just not like, but I think too often we get feedback at the very beginning and then we make a whole bunch of decisions. And then we say, well, we made the decisions based on initial feedback. It's too late now for additional feedback. And we really should be getting feedback in the middle. Um, but that's my that's my philosophy on public engagement. But I think we do it wrong most of the time. Um, we won't fight in public here, Zariah. <laughs> we'll fight in private. Well, and I, just to sort of go go back to it, and then happy to turn to Councilor Grant. I mean, my own thoughts on what the police commission would present on at our next meeting is I do think that, um, and again, we'll see if they're still in the same place as they were. Uh, what's the date of this memo? April of 2022. Um, but I do think their feedback on the draft ordinance that was put together is pretty specific in a way that I think will be helpful for the purposes of our discussion. You know, it starts with, at the very beginning, um, to the extent the police commission is set up with some investigatory authority, uh, what should the breadth of that authority be? Does it cover all complaints, including internal complaints? Does it only cover uh, external complaints uh, uh, that are filed by residents, or would it cover internal complaints from other officers as well? Um, it talks about the size of the police commission and whether or not terms should be staggered. It talks about um, you know the, the the type of authority the police commission would have to uh, say issue subpoenas and gather additional information. And so I'm hopeful that they will get into the weeds a little bit and, and perhaps we can be a little bit more pointed between now and May 30th as to sort of where they are on the specific proposals that were put on the table on some of these other items. Um, Do they have a duty to tell the truth? Who? Do they? Who's they? This mission because you know that's the thing that people have problem with police is that they do stuff on a, you know in darkness well and sorry so sorry to, i'm sorry to interrupt the police commission is not the police the police commission is uh, right so they're still friends I, you have to understand the friendship okay all right thank you um she has a problem. yeah do, do you want to turn to council grant first or do you want to go jordan or? Um, I'll just be really brief, which is that um, the, um, I just, I know I committed at the last meeting that we would have a memo prepared by this meeting on the mayor's position with respect to um, a police oversight charter change. And we are, are still working on that document, but as we consider feedback, I want to make sure that we are um, giving the police commission and the committee the correct um, position to respond to and the most the mayor's most recent position and it has evolved and gotten more specific since the veto memo so that is forthcoming and I just want to I would ask that we not ask people to res the police commission to respond to the veto memo because the mayor's position has refined more so after a year of um, working through police disciplinary processes. 
Um, the, it was, I said that the mayor's position on what a charter change should include has evolved since he wrote his um, veto memo after we've spent a year working under the new um, police commission complaint policy and the mayor's executive order about reviewing use of force incidents. I totally support getting all that stuff. I, I think the ideas in the, and it's not the veto memo, but the memo before that, um, a couple of days, well, a few, a few weeks before, uh, are worthy of looking at. There, there's good ideas. I'm not saying that the, these are the mayor's position now and that should be, you know, acknowledged by everybody. I, I acknowledge that, that you all have evolved, but there are important ideas in here that should be looked at uh, or integrated or people should do what uh, Zariah is suggesting at some point in time. Just one more thing that I want to say. I hate to add one more document to the list of documents, but something that I have, that we in the mayor's office have found to be very useful, and I would um, advise, and I'll, I'll circulate it amongst the committee, I would advise all committee members to review, is a memo that um, then city attorney Eileen Blackwood wrote uh, describing police oversight models in several different cities and how they worked. It was very comprehensive and useful, and I think it would be um, helpful to the committee to understand what different models in other cities have looked like. And we, the mayor has based his position in part after um, considering those models in other cities. Yeah, I think it's a point that's well taken, Jordan. Uh, and Kim, are you able to add Attorney Blackwood's memo to uh, yes. board docs for that purpose? Okay, thank you. And the latest iteration of that, because there were like three or four different uh, different versions of that based on the conversation at the Charter Change Committee, which I have somewhere buried in <laughs> some folder here. So. I know we have Director Durfee here for our next item. Uh, Milo. I see Councilor Grant has her, her hand up. Um, Milo, uh, do you have a comment? Yes. Um, so some of the things that were on my mind were said, and I kind of come down in the, the middle. Um, as someone who's been living this, breathing this for almost four years, um, we definitely want to get the police commission's kind of opinion in terms of what they want to see in an oversight model. Um, and the reason we want to do this is because we have all of these documents, and while they have a mixture of uh, some good ideas, there's also ideas in there that's meant to suppress oversight so we really want to be careful, although I do believe that anyone who's not read through these that's on this committee should um, and should be going through the CNA. It's a lot, it's a lot of work, but in order to be fully um, informed and to avoid talking about things that have literally been talked about like over and over again, because we're dealing, we're dealing with um, oh gosh, how can I put it? There, there have been some who have been very, very engaged and are very well aware of the progression um, of the conversation in the community and the progression of the work on the police commission. And then there have been others who have been the exact opposite. So everybody's got to kind of come in a little bit because. I get a little bit frustrated, and I know it's me, because once again, I've been reading this, that, oh, we got to talk about this again. We've already gone over this how many times, but I'm trying to be patient because I understand, okay, now we're getting to the point where the city council made a promise to come back to this after something, quite frankly, was abandoned um, because they saw that this was still an issue in the community and this issue was not going to go away. Um, the other thing I want to make sure is that in our overall goals that we have a clear understanding that this is about protecting the residents. 
residents of the city. The police department has its own process. And they make their decisions and the, the citizen oversight board is there to help protect residents. And we can't lose sight of that. Um, and I feel that that gets muddled sometimes. Um, I will go back and I'll look at that document from Eileen Blackwood, um, but I would prefer to use examples like the um, Commission and Oversight Board in Connecticut. I think that's something we should really be looking at. Um, at times, you know, I, I, I have respect for Attorney Blackwood, but um, her opinions were sometimes very, very conservative and did, was, didn't really address what was happening in our city um, and didn't really address the changes that our, our society, not just in Burlington or in Vermont, but in our country are, are demanding. So we have to be honest about those conversations as well. And I think one of the important reasons why you know, having a lawyer has been so helpful is the lawyer is there for the work of the commission as an oversight body and is there for the residents of Burlington, whereas the city attorney's office has been there for the city and for the police department. And um, somehow we are going to um, have to understand why it has to be has to be kept separate because the city hasn't always been there for the residents. Thank you. Thanks, Milo. Any other comments, questions from counselors? All right, uh, Director Durfee, thank you very much for your patience. Um, appreciate your being here. Why don't we move this mic down in your direction a little bit further. Uh, I know you had prepared a presentation. Um, if someone, do you want someone to? I yeah, I, I sent it to you and okay. um, uh, attorney, Someone, not you. <laughs> the wrong. I didn't know you'd be here. Hi, Kim. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, Kim, I'm just going to forward it to you if okay. you're able to share it on the screen. So, um, hi, Zaria. Zaria um, it serves on the HR committee too. So, um, we hope to. It's a great group here to talk about internal discipline. I'm just going to go over the city's process. Um, about this is what we do internally so that because I find I was a police commissioner too with Commissioner Grant um, honored to serve alongside of her uh, was appointed by the mayor in 2021 um, right directly after that work you know I'm here uh, directly as a result of that work and um, doing um, work internally so I, I think it's really important and one of the things that I found valuable as a police commissioner was what's the internal process what does the contract say what, what happens inside? Because to me, um, as a person, um, you need to know that. That's something that we need to um, let folks know and um, get that, get that um, information out to the community um, because we as the administration take feedback too. And I am part of the administration now, but I also, um, and a Bur I'm a Burlingtonian, I live on North Avenue, and um, I'm very invested in this topic. So. Thanks for having me. And as soon as we uh, can share screen, I will. My my presentation is not riveting, um, but I think it really <laughs> makes. I think it makes sense to, to share with the public um, and everyone who's commented what 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 can happen, what what to what extent um, is the city involved, um, because the police do have, as you'll see in my presentation, um, some differentiations. The city has four unions. Um, BPOA is one of them. It's the that is the um, you know police union, and I'm just stalling as I try to wait for the screen. Did you get it, Kim? Me too. Okay, great. And and, and is, so oh good, and so I'll just you know talk about this really quickly um, for my portion of the meeting. So, you know, this has been asked of me from the police commission, and I'm I did not know they weren't going to be here. So. I think it's really important. Um, I wish they were here. I kind of wanted to like whisper to somebody I should leave and come back for the next one, but hopefully um, there's a time when this information can be shared. I speak with Stephanie Seguino, 
uh, quite often. So um, she has asked, just to be clear, the police commission has would like to see this too. So um, you can go to the next slide. So we, as I said, we have four contracts which include discipline clauses. Um, we also have a uh, comprehensive personnel policy manual that applies to all city employees. Can you minimize that window? <laughs> Oh, you're trapped. Let me, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll get it. I, you okay. keep going. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> the world of hybrid meetings is challenging. Okay, great. So thank you, Kim um, and Ben. So the city has four contracts, and I think the one we're focused on is the police contract here. The personnel policy manual applies to all city employees. So if there's an infraction, um, it, it governs those infractions. The police are not exempt from that manual. Dr um, department directives. Um, the only department that has directives uh, is the Burlington Police Department. They have 29 directives and that hyperlink goes right to the website. Anything I say here can be found on the city's website, including the contracts. The contracts are on the human resources page and you can download a PDF and read through those. The personnel policy is also on the city's website and the police directives are also on the website. So um, really happy to hear about transparency and the need for transparency because we do try to put, put this out here. We just need to talk to the people about them. So next slide. So the policy manual, um, the purpose of the policy manual is to combine in one place personnel policies and benefits applicable to city employees. With the exception of the school department, um, it says they're, they have, they're covered under a collective bargaining agreement. Not everybody is, that's sort of incorrect. But if these policies conflict with any other policies contained in a contract or any bargaining unit recognized in the city, the contract shall supersede these policies for any member of that union. Now, when I got here in 2021, I read the police contract. Milo and I read the police contract, and um, it it there there isn't anything that 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 is conflicting in the BPOA contract. I really um, worked hard to make sure that you know that is aligned, and um, we should be making sure that's the truth in all contracts. Next slide. Um, we have city policy violations. Just want to cover. So we're talking about the policy manual. There's two primary sections in the policy manual if you're referencing it. And again, you know, this is gonna be a document heavy committee, I know, but please give these a look. Um, the, the most prevalent section is section eight, which outlines the expectations around employee behavior. Um, and section 12, which outlines the policies pertinent to the use of city property. So any violation of policy can be grounds for progressive discipline for anybody, it, it does not, say, uh, you know, if you're a police officer, you know, or if you are a, a line worker that you're exempt. It's for everybody. Um, next slide. And, you know, I think most folks in this room have read the department directives. Um, uh, AFSCME recognizes these directives. Um, the departments may, del this is in our policy manual. So departments may develop their own department directives for the administration of their department and encouraged to use a similar employee involvement process. Um, I'm not gonna read this whole thing. It, um, it's right on the website. You can see the rules, the directives. Um, in that way, there's an extra level of behavior that's expected. And so some of the directives would include conduct unbecoming. So I, that's the one that I see, you know, you know, and I do see all of it, just, just to let you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think, um, you know, that, that's a good example of, you know, a rule uh, that they might have. And, and I encourage everyone to really look at those rules on the website. Um, the contracts and progressive discipline, these are just all of our unions. These are, and, and this, I think this is posted, but so for your reference, I wanted to put here that you can look at all of the discipline that can be, that's contractual in the city on the city's website. Um, just want to point that out because I know when I was on the police commission, this was really of great interest to me. How does this compare to that? Um, you know, is there, you know, a, a you know, just, a, you know, a, a equity among all of these? And, you know, I find them to be very similar, but I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, next slide. And then this is specific to police contract. Um, their discipline clause is the um, Article 15, quality control performance, counseling and discipline. 
Um, and it just, there's a little blurb under here talking about lower level infractions of policy and procedure typically result in a coaching. That is the same for all employees, training or counseling. Um, this would be, you know, something like I, my uniform is dirty, you know, they can't, they have protocols around their uniforms. Um, you know, my paperwork is late. Uh, you know, I'm not doing, you know, some low level tasks. Maybe I'm not getting along with a coworker. Um, at a very low level. Mid to high level, uh, mid level infractions are repetitive, lower level infractions are generally handled at the lowest possible level. But again, I want folks in this room to know, um, to, to your point, Chief Murad, um, I've worked hard uh, to have a relationship with uh, chief, the chief and I, I really do want to be involved in everything. I think this, this environment, you know, the moment that we're in is really critical and so I do, um, I do, appreciate the level of transparency that I enjoy as Director of Human Resources in the City of Burlington. Um, so uh, we'll go to the next slide and we'll talk about higher level infractions. Okay. Yep. Just, I don't know if it's probably here or later. Can, uh, can I, if you let me go through the slides, I promise I'll answer your question. Okay. Because <laughs> um, it might be later. <laughs> okay. Um, hi higher level infractions could result in more substantial discipline. Um, these could be uh, a, a variety of issues. I can see I spelled veracity. Good spell check, Karen. Um, <laughs> as a variety of issues. Uh, harassment, excessive use of force. These are the ones that um, there are laws that govern excessive use of force. Uh, known associations with targets of investigations or criminals, abuse of authority, failure to follow orders. Again, this is all online and you can read this, but you need to really familiarize yourselves with what is considered a higher level infraction and actually there's a big list um, on, on our website and in the policy manual. This is abbreviated for this meeting. Um, mid and high level infractions can result in a written reprimand. That process is a process that involves me by the contract. It can involve the mayor. Uh, if we're talking about reassignment, demotion, unpaid suspension, dismissal, um, things of that nature, um, it does I I involve uh, me and a lot of other people. Um, I like to be in involved in, I mean, I don't enjoy discipline, but I do think, um, again, the moment that we're in, it's, it's important. Uh, right, next slide. The discipline process um, for everyone, and this is, this is more um, broad for city employees, um, I already talked about lower level infractions. Um, discharge, if someone's going to be leaving, um, that definitely involves the HR director's city attorney's office and the department head, and it can involve the mayor's office. Um, all employees are entitled to an appeal discipline um, and through, through a grievance process. Um, it does depend on what union you're in, um, but those processes, go to the next slide. So just so everyone knows the differences, I think it's just as important to have facts about the differences. If I'm in AFSME, and I know we have AFSME representation here on the call, um, if, if something can't be resolved in a step one grievance, um, if something is not you know, a grievance is when, you know, someone thinks there's a violation of the con contract and it's brought up by an employee, so I can grieve the contract. And I think this is really important because these are, these are processes that all city employees go through. A grievance is sustained when an article of any contract is perceived, again, that thing is in my way, but that's okay, <laughs> as a contract violation. For example, a step one grievance is sent to a supervisor or a manager. It might be like a scheduling issue or a seniority issue. These are lower level infractions. We expect them to be resolved at the department head or manager level. But if there's a step two grievance, and I think this is what's really important about oversight and transparency, um, AFSCME and IBEW are two unions. If the, the issue cannot be resolved, it is, does go to the HR director and HR policy committee, which um, Sarah is here tonight. Sarah is uh, the chair of that committee. Uh, Zariah is a member of the committee and, and Hannah King is a member of that committee. So if there's a grievance, the union will come, um, I'll be there, the committee will be there, and the committee will be asked uh, to make a decision on the grievance. Uh, the police commission hears step two grievances 
for the BPOA. And as a police commissioner, I always thought this was really important. If there is something internal going on and there's a grievance against the chief or the administration of the police department, that police officer can say, and the union can say, okay, no, we want to take it to a step two and it will go before the police commission and the police commission will be involved in that decision process. Uh, the fire commission, fire department takes um, their step two grievances to the fire commission. And I think step two grievances are so important because these are um, internal issues, but I think the public deserves to know, like public bodies preside over these. And so whenever we take something, you know, we can't resolve something, the public is uh, invited. Nobody comes to our committee meetings, but um, they are 8.30 on Friday mornings. But if we have a grievance, we warn them just like any public meeting. And so this can be seen. And I, and I, I think, um, I'm not sure I'll have to ask Attorney Sturdivant, but um, the police commission, when they preside, or, or Milo, uh, the, when they preside over uh, step two, um, that is a closed meeting, or is it? Yeah, it's closed. It yeah. And there's a, the city attorneys there. Um, and so that, that's a process that, again, police commission as the oversight body gets to hear that process. If, if it can't be resolved, the issue could go to arbitration. So again, as a member of the public, I'm really interested in this kind of stuff. Who hears it? Who sees it? It is an employee issue, but it could involve another employee. It involves a work environment, and I think that's all important when we think about the police as a body. Next slide. Sorry, can we say this thing just yeah. the question? Uh, I didn't answer Sarah's question. So, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> This is a, you're going to get two questions. This is just a clarification question. So, sure. a step two grievance is not necessarily a higher level infraction, but can you just talk a little bit more about, like, level one, like, what the difference is between a step one and a step two? What sure. What kinds of things move on to step two? Why they move on to step two? Sure. Um, and what your, like, how the process changes at that? Yes. Level. Yes. And it's a good point. So, um, you know, if a person, if the union um, wants to move right to the step two process, um, it, it can do that. Um, for example, I mean, I don't have a really good example because, again, I'm not in with the um, police commission. But if, if the step two grievances that I would get maybe from an AFSCME member would involve, you know, something maybe that's repetitive that they feel the committee should adjudicate. So say, for example, it's an article that keeps coming up, uh, filling positions uh, over time, something that has come up again and again, and you know the union, for whatever reason, feels that they have not gotten the resolve, they may es elevate it. Um, AFSCME does a really good job of having conversations with people. Um, they really want to you know, talk it through and resolve it at the low, lowest level. So. Um, you can move around, uh, to your point, Councillor Hightower, um, it, the unions can move around if they want to elevate something. And, you know, just like anybody, it's because an issue, they want a bigger body to hear the issue. Um, when the police, um, you know, grieve and it goes to the police commission, you know, they're asking the commission to make a decision on something that internally they feel as employees um, May or may not have been fair. Does that does that answer your question, Councillor Hightower? That does answer the question. And then I don't know if you have a sense of like it seems like group step one is pretty normal, I guess, every day. Like, what is the level? Like, how often do we see things go to group? It's like step two across the city because you're always involved in step two, right? Is that true? I am notified of step two, and I do try to attend. Um, police commission meetings. Um, if there is a step two, there's been one since I've been here in the police department and I did intend attend. If I don't get an invite, I invite myself. And uh, <laughs> I uh, step, when, when I first, uh, Sarah, when Sarah and I first got together, the city was coming back from COVID. Uh, workers had been essential. And so as people started coming back, there was uh, natural conflict beyond a step one. You know, folks really needed to learn how to talk to each other. But 
Uh, by and large, a grievance at step two that goes to the committee um, is rare. I'm gonna go ahead and knock on some plastic here uh, because I'm gonna jinx myself as soon as I say that. But it's, it is very rare. Um, and again, arbitration is, is something that's um, even rarer. Okay, thank you. That's, and sorry. So you said only one went to the HR policy committee, and you know one that went to the police commission. No, when we uh, when we first started, we had what, three. Okay. Yeah, at least yeah, three, and they all actually were resolved at that level. You know, it's again people wanting to be heard, people wanting to make sure that. You know, and a new director will do that too, you right? Like a new HR director, we want to bring these issues to you, and I think that is a fair and really good public process. I was impressed by it, and it, it really taught me a lot about the city right away. Good things. Thank you. Thank you. So, is there one more slide here? Can one more. I, I know Sarah, I'm wrap it up, Sarah. Sarah. Sarah yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the discipline process. This is this is talks about <clears throat> discharge. All, all union and non-union employees are entitled to a pre-termination hearing. If the union, in the union it's often called a louder mill hearing, which is part of the due process. Um, that's for everybody. Um, the require, a requirement that must be provided to a public employee prior to removing or impacting the employment of property right. In such a hearing, the employee has a chance to provide additional details prior to termination, and I think this is really important that the public knows that this exists. Um, this is a mechanism that is extended to everyone, uh, including the police. It is in their contract. It's also in the policy manual. If and when an employee is involuntary discharged or terminated, they have the right to appeal the decision under the section 9.4 or 9.5 of the police manual. Ask me, raise their hand, okay. Uh, I, I'm reading the screen because I can't really see uh, anybody anymore. So the appeal is heard by the Human Resource Policy Committee. So if I'm discharged, even after I'm, I'm discharged, I have the right to appeal that. Um, and I can, um, if I'm an employee and I say, you know, hey, I want, I want to go in front of the committee, which is an arm of the city council, um, you have that right. So. And that's, that's going to conclude, I see a lot of questions, that concludes my presentation. And I think Councillor Carpenter wanted to make a comment. Um, if I have this right, I know that you, you have staff, um, liaisons in your office that work with each of the different departments like DPW or, yep. and um, I presume part of their role is if a manager is having an issue with an employee they would consult and talk about what do I do next. Do, do you have that kind of relationship with the police department? Or you do, so you have an employee that c could meet with a supervisor or manager of the police departments before level one or after level one or level two to, to talk about like what to do next and get coaching on yeah. like management issues. We could talk about management for a long time, you and I, <laughs> yeah. but I would say that it became clear to me very early on that I wanted to be involved in the police discipline. So the folks who work, report to me who cover the departments, who are liaisons to the departments, they um, will handle things like how to do a coaching, administrative, um, you know, you know, forms, you know, uh, they might come and talk to me about something low level, but if it is a discipline matter with the police, it is always me. It, it should be, um, you know, the director only because, you know, no one, you know, I mean, we all know, you know, that, that I want to be involved in these high level things, but, you know, it, it could be as simple as just calling me and saying, and the chief, the chief is good about this, he'll call and say, I have something, let me run it by you. And so I have really been the liaison um, for the most part, myself, my assistant director, um, currently Tim Clancy, who worked with the um, state for the state of Vermont, is handling. And I think it's the same for AFSCME too. IBW is sort of silent because it's sort of its own entity. But if it's if it's a, if it's something that we need, it's a, if it's impacting work culture and people's. Um, I haven't been here long enough to let those go beyond my desk. I want to get involved. If it's if it's more than a coaching more than a conversation and I want to mention too that as people come back to work in person there are 
what we might have considered before COVID lower level things that people, um, that I think healing the work culture and getting everybody working together and, and making sure that people are on the same page. I don't think there is a high, high level. I, I, I wanna be at that level with the employees. My duty is to the employees. So um, I, t I tend to get involved in anything that I think needs my attention and with the police, um, you know, is it a lot? No, but I, I'd like to be involved. I hope that answers. Okay. Uh, there were three folks that had their hand raised, not on the committee, so why don't we turn there and then we can come back to see if there's any questions from the council. Uh, Bruce, you had your hand raised first, and then we'll go Romeo and then Andy online. So, Bruce. And then Romeo, City Council. Oh. Hello, Honorable City Councilors. Um, HR. She Zariah needs you to, do you need him to turn to the camera or you want him to come over? I don't know, I think it's, 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 it's a this. disc. It's this, this is the microphone, I believe. Oh, okay, this is the you microphone. Bruce, microphones. Take, take that microphone there. Oh, take this don't, one. Don't, yeah. it, it's not very long, so you might want to come over here. Oh, that don't unplug there. yourself, don't unplug you. <laughs> Speak. Now you got two microphones. Two microphones. And like I was saying, I will say um, hello, honorable city council peoples. Thank you for allowing me to ask this one question, HR and honorable in the uh, mayor's office. Thank you. Um, so I um, looked over to um, Burlington Police. Um, well, first of all, um, I sit on a lot of boards and commissions. One, one thing, one, one commission that I'm very proud of, I'm a commissioner for the Human Rights Commission for the state of Vermont. And so um, I looked over, um, and then, uh, well, I'm not actually really proud of this one, but I am on the Vermont State Police, fair and partial policing and community. But when I look over the Burlington Police Department's website, I see nothing about fair and partial policing. So I wonder, do you have a fair and partial policing policy? For, do, do they have one, should I say? You know, we do, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a, there is no policy in the, in the, in the documents that I've reviewed, Bruce, uh, thanks for your question, I have not, that is not a part of, I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, it's in the directives. It's not an HR uh, department policy. Directives. I'm talking about the, the stuff that I went over. We, so, so did you want to answer that question for Bruce? Um, it's, it's, an, it's not a personnel policy. It's part of um, the police department policies. We do have a fair and impartial it, policy. And it was on their website when I was a police commissioner. I, I, I don't know where to direct you to, but I just I thought maybe you were asking questions of is it in the, any of the things that I presented, so. No, I, I, was, I was just, I, I thought you was gonna to get to it, you know what I mean? I thought you was gonna say something about F, FIP. And another thing, so since, since um, since they do have a FIP policy, fair and partial policing policy, that I guess they follow, um, how, how did they get trained and, where, and how long was it? On the policy? The fair and partial policing policy. How, how, long, how long was the training? I, I don't know. Uh, Bruce, I wonder if your questions are more appropriate for the police chief. I think Karen's talking about employee discipline. He's speaking and about directives and policies, procedures, and how HR operates, and and so I thought that question might be. But I, I, think I get that's it, Jordan. Good feedback, Bruce. I'm not. I'm not. I get it. I understand. I understand, Jordan. I think I, I should know the answer to that yeah. question. No, it's okay. It's, it's nothing. Nothing hard hit against you or anything. It's just that. Um. um so, because I work with chiefs around the, around the state, um, I, just, I wasn't going to um, ask this for a certain police department about their fair and partial policing policy. I just was going in and we was learning about community, you know, what you do in the community, what you, how do you act with the community, what do you do for the community, how do you work with the community. And then so I, I just thought, well, I'm going to ask them. So I asked them, do you have a fair and partial policing policy? And they say, yeah. I said, wow, that's awesome. How long was your training? I mean, where'd you get your training from? They said, we took our training online. It was probably about a half an hour. And so, um, and so I, I just, you know, it threw me like for a loop, you know what I mean? And so I think that, um, 
that's why I asked how, you know, how long it was and you know where was it because I think uh, any type of fair and partial um, policing training should be with between a facilitator you know and not just online because I don't think probably maybe a person who don't look like me might have created the, the training you know and so if they don't look like me then I don't think that um or some some like me I think that it's you know <laughs> They should they should get somebody who looks like me or somebody who who um have experience like I do, you know. But um, it was no hit against you. I just I, I looked at the I looked at that website. I didn't see it at all. I didn't see FIP. Like you go to St Vermont State Police, give it to them. They got they got the FIP South Burlington. They got FIP. They got policy right there. You see it, you know. And um, Burlington Police being our largest police force in the state, don't I don't see it, you know. And and so it bothers me, you know, because I you know. It bothers me because a lot of this, like I was on fair and partial policing, and we did a data collection, right, about um, poli um, about stops for people who look like me, right. And then one year we did it, and and it was bad, pitiful. And then the next time we did it, it still was pitiful. I mean, how can how can you stop people who look at me? Eighty five percent, and eighty five percent of the people you who look at me, you stop. And it's only like zero point one percent of the people who look like me in the state, you know. And, that, and so to me. There is, there's no, there's no really policy, there's no directives, there's no, it's just um, what, it's, it, do what you think, you know. So that, that's what I like. I to think say. that's really good feedback, and I think if you're going to talk about policy, you should be talking about all the policies. So I, that is well, well said, and I do think um, I should know the answers of how long the training takes because these are city employees. So thank you for that. No, that's no, the no, next no, time no, I see no, you, I'll have those answers. No, that's okay. You know, you can send my email. I'm easy to find. Just, just Google my name. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. awesome. you know, I'm oh, I know, I know. Yeah. But you are correct, and I really do appreciate that feedback. I know Mila's got her hand up now, but. Well, she, she could probably speak to it, but go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Um, yeah, please. Um, so my question was a specific presentation. Would it be available to the public as well as PDF format? We can just go online and download it, or? We should post the presentation to Board Docs. OK. Uh, so that page I just navigated to, it, it should be posted there. And I know um, you're speaking specifically to personnel situation, not necessarily like if the public have, say, to submit a complaint, it's like there's a tier to go through, like grievance one, grievance two, the public that can go through, like say if somebody submitted a complaint about a police officer or anybody within the city personnel as well. So um, I don't know if this pertains to you as, as, as the HR director, but in terms of like... I'm sorry, but we're really it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll repeat, thank you. We'll sorry, repeat the no. question uh, once. Romeo, why don't you go ahead and then we can repeat the question. Okay, for I just wanted to find out if there was like a, there's a TIA process to go through where the public, they say like submit a complaint to the city, either the police department through the police commission or directly to the chief or directly to you. And then there's a, like a tier to go through where they find out where that situation is. Or this only just applies to the personnel. Based on I, no, I think that you Karen, that's a sorry. Good, Thank you. Folks online, could you repeat the question as you so, so the question is, is there a tiered system to report complaints? Do I have that right, Romeo? Yes. So, uh, no. I mean, you know, I've had people come visit my office and complain, um, citizens. Um, I don't have, you know, I can't, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times I just listen, but the police department has a very specific process, and that is the portal. And that is very helpful. You know, that you know, was developed so that, you know, people could anonymously if they wanted to and they didn't have to call the police department and uh, I've used the portal. Um, and so that's that's the tool that a police, uh, a complaint from the public about the police uh, comes through. Is, and does that answer your question, Romeo? Yes, yes. If another city employee, like say for example, somebody goes into city hall and um, is not treated appropriately by a staff member, um, you know, there's, there isn't a, a public complaint portal, but um, we do, you know, I would address those complaints as if it was a complaint from another employee. Uh, if it gets to me, you know, um, things that do get to me, you know, I usually get the discrimination complaints. If there is something like that, we take those very seriously. Um, but mostly um, the police portal is what the, is the tool that is used to give feedback on those individuals. So one last question sure. uh, regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. How does that uh, 
translates to the entire, I guess you are the director of the entire city, I guess, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I was wondering in terms of uh, uh, DEI training, how, is, how, how does that training work? in relation so, to the presentation that you just did. Yeah, so the question is um, for people online, how does DEI training work? And so um, the Racial Equity and Inclusion and Belonging Department facilitated uh, from 2020, um, I think 2021, they implemented a process. There is a new director, there was a search. Um, uh, so Director Kim Carson will be um, taking over and facilitating that training in conjunction with human resources. So we will do that together, um, but we're really excited about that. She just completed her reorganization and so we will move forward with that. In terms of onboarding though, we do have an, a, an extensive onboarding where we do cover a lot of ground when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Vanessa Santos Eugenio uh, is our talent and recruitment uh, manager and she was um, the director of inclusive excellence at UVM and she does the onboarding with an extensive piece on that so that when people come in the door they understand uh, what we're asking for in terms of diversity equity and inclusion great thank you Romeo um, we have Andy and then Milo and I think a couple other comments here in the room um, I'll just say I'm mindful that we have another agenda item and want to talk about some of the CNA items and the library closes at eight o'clock so we need to give ourselves uh, some buffer here on our agenda but want to make sure we get around to everyone. Um, Andy you had your hand raised next and then we'll go to Council Grant. Great. Um, thanks. So I just to uh, make a couple comments and then I have to have some questions. Um, First, I just want to make very clear that the Aspen Local 1674, um, me and also fellow rank and file member here, I don't work for the city, we work for Howard Center, so mm -hmm. we're about that Aspen. Um, and love the workers at our 1343, but that's not us. Um, and I, I just kind of want to um, make as clear as possible that what would be an escalated grievance for a city worker, most likely, in, in some situations are not going to look the same as an EPOA escalation to a step two grievance. Um, and I'm sure that there are examples where there are similarities. I'm also sure that there are differences. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd also like to point out that when we're looking at discipline for EPOA employees versus the Aspen City employees, those um, situations that we're talking about looking at police oversight very different than what city workers uh, may may be complained about by the public, right? Like city workers who work at a front desk somewhere um, are not going to tackle somebody. Um, like that is not part of what their job is, and it's also not something that they have the ability to do on the job. And and what we're here for is to to look at those high I can't remember how you put it on the slide, but those cases where things go up, they're escalated. And I just kind of want to bring that focus there that, like, when we're talking about unions and we're talking about workers, that workers for the city and all those other unions are very different than the BPOA. And we would really appreciate it if you don't conflate them as the exact same type of worker union because they are different. Um, and I just want to make that clear. The questions that I had were, um, at one point we talked about, we talked about how for high level infractions, uh, for, I think it was BPOA or maybe for all of the unions, you said like a lot of people will be involved. Were you just referring to when it goes to like the police commission or to the HR commission, or were you talking about that there are other folks involved in so who are those folks? Can, uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. So the HR committee is comprised of three. First of all, to your point, I'm, I'm asked to come here and report on what happens in the city on for everyone. So I, I don't, I wasn't asked to come and have a specific police focus. I know 1674 is different than 1343, but ask me, uh, 93 is, you know, you know, I apologize for not making that distinction. 
secondly, uh, when we talk about looking at high level infractions, city government has the HR committee so that our counselors are aware. So there can be um, in executive session, the three counselors, myself, uh, any, uh, any leadership of AFSME can be there, including the treasurer. Um, so, so that can equate to a lot of people. And then there's the person who is grieving. Um, so those meetings can get pretty large. If the BPOA has a step two, um, there's the, in, the entire commission, um, myself, uh, city attorney, um, and then whoever is making um, the grievance or complaint. Uh, so there, there are a lot of people um, when something, and I, I think that the point I'm trying to make about that is that this is not happening in a vacuum. I, I feel really good as a black woman who lives in Burlington to know that there's a lot of people listening to these conversations because these conversations do happen in executive session and it's important to me to make sure that the counselors that were elected that I voted for are in on these decisions. I can give a, a really good example, and I can tell you, you know, the uh, grievance that went to a step two um, in the police department was over the employee did not believe that um, they should be disciplined um, for um, not completing paperwork, and that was a grievance, and um, you know that 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 was what the grievance was about. Um, similarly, um, an AFSME or IBEW may grieve, you know, the same thing. I think my point is, you know, say, say I, and that's, that's a good distinction to make here, is that when a grievance happens, it's, it's really about the contract. So if you didn't, you know, a lot of times it's about accrued time, uh, you know, scheduling. Um, it, I have not witnessed a high level infraction where um, you know there was excessive use of force and, and what have you. You know, I've been with the city for two years, and I'm not trying to say at all. And I want you to everybody to hear me loud and clear that there's you know no reason, and everybody's the same. Um, people have different jobs, but I think it, it is okay for me to say that um, high-level infractions um, that I've witnessed and seen in the time that I've been the director. Um, have been across the board, uh, you know, um, it could be in any sector. Uh, I have not been, when I was on the police commission, commission yes, and those are executive session issues, um, but not as the director of HR have I seen, um, you, know, you know, it's just, it's really, I think I joined at a time where police oversight was, you know, on the table and, you know, uh, the police force was small and, you know, we're rebuilding, right? And I think there are members of the police department and there are members of the city who would really like to see that be successful. And so I'm very fortunate to not have seen anything rise to the level where I would, um, you know, have to be deeply concerned or ethically conflicted. I hope that answers your question, Andy. It does. I appreciate it. And I was going to do the clarification just for No worries. No worries. I really appreciate it. I, appre I appreciate asking. No matter what the number. Uh, Milo, can we turn to you now? Uh, I want to first thing. Um, I, I disagree, so I, I not disagree. I agree with Andy's comments. Um, I was wondering uh, some of the about myself. Uh, myself. Uh, I think I'm getting tired. Um, they're really strong points. The one of the things that's really difficult is that um, our officers want to be treated like other employees 
until they don't. And that has been an ongoing issue, and that's something that we have to really have an honest, that has to be part of the honesty in these conversations. They aren't like other employees uh, because of the powers that they have. Um, I will also say that the grievance process, um, as it currently works, is not really the issue to be tinkered with because it's actually the process that works. The process that has not worked and has continued to be very adversarial is when it comes to issues of protecting the residents of Burlington. Mm -hmm. um, that's when we get to the new phase. Uh, other issue regarding the um, department's website, it's terrible. The city's website is terrible. Just accessing information in general um, can be very, very difficult. And um, ever since I started being part of this, I have brought up a number of issues about the city's website and uh, the, the police departments in particular and how you can't access certain information or information that is there is extremely outdated. Um, I've also brought up some of that information with the mayor as well. I think it would benefit from um, an overhaul, you know, just starting to do it a little bit at a time. And this, this issues were brought up when um, they still had the staff. So um, that is definitely a fair point about trying to find some information on some policies and trying to get information on um, training is very, very difficult um, as well. It was also difficult during the CNA, uh, their process of getting information. And um, the issue of the training about fair and impartial policing, that, that has some good points. Um, the, the recommendation, there was a recommendation that was made to embrace the process and let the process work. That didn't quite happen. They did an online training. I foresee am trying to get some more specific information about that training. Um, REIB director Kim Carson, uh, she recently spoke um, about that training. Uh, she thought it was a, a good training. So um, I would like the department to be willing to open itself up to um, a process that involves a review of the data. Uh, they continue to block that, but um, there was a good review on the recent training from the RAIB director. And uh, those are just the comments I wanted to make on what was recently said. Thank you. Thank you, Milo. Uh, before bringing it back to the room here, Zaria, did you have a comment? Yeah, it was just, just to say that, to be clear, and I think everybody was on the call last time, but still to say that I was the one who asked for us to look at it, some of the other, what happens in the rest of the city for um, discipline and partially I feel like that's also because sometimes I think the police department is actually held to a lower standard than some of our other employees like a prime example being the chiefs and one chief having a fake account and getting suspension for it and another chief being rude to employees and getting fired for it not a chief but a um, department head so I just like I actually think I think I wanted the comparison because at a minimum we shouldn't be holding the department, which has so much more power and authority, to the same standard as some of our other employees. And then I'm not sure right now that I see consistency mm -hmm. um, across our city staff. Yeah, I think um, that is, I think the pol having the police commission is a start. I think having the police commission involved on the first level complaints that come through the portal and having them have access to it is a start. Um, I think that, that that's really, um, that's been a, a good process from my opinion, but also, you know, again, reporting just internally, uh, the police commission, um, what, I think that you know what the ask is is to understand what the processes are just to be clear I think there is some equity but there's also citizens are on police commission is made up of citizens so citizens do um, do get to um, see the complaints first and they get to um, give their feedback in that process so you know I'm I'm feeling I feel better internally 
uh, knowing that I, I've seen the process from beginning to end. Can we do more? That's why we're here. So. Great, and then, um, thank you, Karen. And then the second comment is um, the, sorry, is um, a little bit of just like, so like changing the processes. So just wanting us to think about that. I think, and I don't know if this is true, but I think that if we put investigatory authority into the police commission, which is something we're talking about, then I think they can't also be the level, like the step two. Um, because that, to some extent, is an appeal process. So that means we have to have a new appeal process, and Karen, I'll let you confirm that. But then I'll just finish my last point, um, so you don't have to come back to me, which is the, like, I think in this conversation, and I'm going ahead a little bit back to my, like, diagram, like, what are we talking about? I think we're talking both about oversight, and then I think there's some other things that we're starting to talk about, which is transparency, which are related, but not necessarily the same. And so, you know, some things like what Milo said about, like, you know, like training, like it was really hard to figure out during the CNA report, like what training folks had even gotten and who had taken it. Um, and then there's also a lot of data, and I feel like we heard a lot of things around, like, even just with the data that Police Commission, uh, the Police Commission, the Police Department is collecting, um, a lot of, like, narrative around it that it's like, but none of it's a problem. And so just having some transparency around, like, I mean, I'll leave it at that, but I think that there's two conversations that are happening right now, and I think they're related, but I also just want to flag that some of the things we're talking about oversight, I think can be addressed with transparency issues, which may or may not be in the same body of the police commission, depending on what makes the most sense for us. Thank you. And forgive me for piping in, because I wanted to just quickly say, that that is such an important point because I've said over and over again, this is not always about discipline. This is about knowing that something happened and to prevent it from happening again, there may be the need to do additional training. And that is where most of this adversarial relationship in, it happens is because there's this fundamental disagreement um, about what is adequate training. That's a big part of it. So we're, we're looking at these big things or, uh, that I'm not sure are the main problems, right? That's my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Milo Zarai. Uh, just bring it back to the room. Are there any quick comments or questions from anyone who hasn't spoken yet? I'll let it pass for it. Okay. Thank you. Sarah? Um, just to be quick, and um, at some point I need to understand the process of the police portal and how those complaints get traveled through the process. Because our char a big part of our charge is to look at the process um, and make it work better than it has been. I think it's important for us to focus on that and a lot of the issues which are so critical, like training and communication, aren't going to get fixed by fixing the discipline process. I think the Public Safety Committee has a lot of work to do on all of the work from the CNA report and ongoing. So I just want to make sure that we kind of understand that, that the, whatever process we agree on and whatever process might need the tweak of an ordinance and a charter change doesn't, in whole cloth, fix the culture problems that's, uh, that we may need to work on. So I just want to make sure we kind of focus on that. So if I, so the flow chart should be an accurate description of the process, and that is included in all the documents that we've got tonight. So you should take a look at that. We've had criticism tonight that it funnels power and that what we need is actually a broader review in power. So there are, there's already been comments that we've taken with relationship to the, the flow chart. Um, and there are references to, um, to other documents in here that can be linked to that. So let me just 
you know, for your edification. It, it's available, and it's available for everybody, right? Because y'all can get this. This is that's the idea. Um, I just had a couple quick questions, Karen, um, and thanks for the great presentation. So, for a termination, the louder mill hearing, does that happen? before any grievance process would begin? And then do you grieve the outcome of the Loudermill hearing? Or does the Loudermill he hearing happen in the context of the grievance process? That, that's just a high level of view. Loudermill is the end of the grievance process. So I grieve, or I mean, it doesn't even, you know, a, a Loudermill can be, happen, a Loudermill just happens so an employee can, that is facing termination can have a, a chance to speak. So it's really not the part of the, it can happen in any part of the process. Um, and then there's an appeal process that after termination, um, an employee has 15 days to decide if they want to appeal. And that, you know, again, I'm just, I'm just, I was asked to report on internal processes, so that would not apply to something like excessive use of force or anything like that with the police department. Okay. That would be law, the violation of. Um, right. Okay, and is all discipline within the police department grievable? So if, you know, it's something like a written warning, for example, that's placed or into a, a police officer's personnel file, is, is that grievable or does it have to be higher level for it to go through the grievance process? No, it, it's grievable, but it has to be a violation of con con contract for it to sustain the grievance. Okay. Because you could just deny the grievance if it's not a violation of okay. contract. And my last question brings us back to this question of transparency. So I think we all have some sense as to what happens from with external citizen complaints, the process that that goes for, and Jean just cited to it, and we've talked some now about if an internal complaint is raised, something that perhaps you know triggers an investigation within the police department uh, where they review it. Um, can, can you, and I think you touched on this a little bit, but can you confirm to what extent is your office brought in on something like that? If there is an internal complaint and the department decides that they're going to investigate it internally, to what extent is your office brought in on it? And then I think the follow-up question to that is, of course, we're talking about grievances here. Of course, the only way we hear about a grievance is if the union decides to appeal something. If discipline is issued that is not grieved, can you speak to the extent to which your office is informed of discipline generally? So two questions there. Yeah. When, 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 if at all, brought in on the investigation? When, if at all, are you informed about discipline that's not grieved? Um, the, I am brought in on the, in, any internal investigation. I do hear, uh, you know, I hear it, I review the documents, I sit at the table um, through that process. Um, and in terms of a, if it was, if, some, if a grievance happened, you know, when the grievance pro process starts, I'm informed right away. Okay, but if it's not grieved, if discipline is issued by the police department that is, does not go through the grievance process, is right. your office informed of that? Or is it just put in the police officer's personnel file and it sort of stays internal to the department? Yeah, if it's a violation of directives, if it's, you know, a uniform or something, you know, very low level, I wouldn't be informed. If it's high level, mid, mid, mid to high level, I, I, I am informed. Okay. Uh, very... I'm involved. Chief consults you yes. as through the process of yes, making yes. that decision. I, I, you're, it's not just you're informed of it, you're involved in the process as the chief makes the decision. Yes. I can confirm that is true. Okay. <laughs> and that and is I just true. ask, is that by the executive order, by <coughs> practice, by by what how does that happen? It's just, I need, to, it's my role and it's outlined in, you know, policy, procedure. It's, I mean, I, I it's sorry. It's practice and the mayor's expectation that the chief work with the HR director when but any I department. I say for myself though, that I, I, I do, you know, I, I really would, you know, thank you, Jordan, but, and, and maybe I'm not using the correct language here, but I am involved and I'm formed on everything. I mean, I did not come here to not be involved and informed on every, it, the, the, the mayor does expect me to be involved, he expects the chief to work with me, I think that was one of the reasons that I was appointed off the commission. So, I, I am involved. So it would be really helpful to get all the documents 
related to the disciplinary process uh, so that we can see uh, what may need to be, what desire to be codified in ordinance or charter because the union contract, I got it right up here, the current one, is very specific about the discipline process and also the grievance process. And the charter is supplementary to the contract and everything else is sort of overarches, but you read that in, in concert and it doesn't have any of this process except it says that there's a hearing. So any relationship in terms of the police discipline process um, with HR is got to be done through something else than these two documents because I, I, there may have been one thing that I saw in reading this that relates to HR, but it would be very helpful for this committee, this joint committee, to get those documents so that we can get that out to the public if you've done it already. Well, I, just, I don't think that there's a specific document. I think it's just the practice of this administration that it the, would be with, great to get I appreciate that not to, to but if there is no document, right, then we should be told there is no document because that might be fine for this administration, but y'all are humans. And therefore, you will all be dead sometime, and somebody else will take <laughs> over. And yeah. it, and therefore, yeah. the, the, the corporate body, that's the beauty of institutions. They go on until somebody kills them. I, I, I understand that you're saying that perhaps the HR's role in the disciplinary process should be codified. And I, there, there's not a specific directive or policy that articulates the way in which the police department is to engage HR. but. The practice of this and the practice of this administration has been that department heads are expected to engage HR on employee disciplinary matters because of HR's expertise on those issues. Except the first year I was a counselor, we didn't have an HR director, so there was a big gap. Right. And so I just I think the concept we had an of interim HR director. Well, you had an interim. Yes, you, yes, we did. But the con the conversation about codifying it, I think, is just where that's why I asked the question, and I think is worth exploring. And, and what I would like is documentary proof of the, the status quo. And it's either in, a, and there may be a document, there may not be. If there isn't a document, y'all just send us saying, there is no document, but this is our practice, and lay it all out. And then actually, then you got a document. I think just last week, uh, Director Durfee, Chief Murad, and the mayor met on a um, potential police disciplinary issue. We had a so it, it is uh, part of our routine practice to to, to include. It people. is, but I, I do hear the, you know as the commissioner, you know, and when I was police commissioner, co the codification. We really do, the, you know, people leave. I'm appointed. I get it. I understand, and I think there was a specific reason, right, Moreau? was very confident and in, in the fact that you know I was not going to you know I was going to be involved and he's always had that as a practice but I do agree that it should be written down right I, I make what this formal saying? request for this document please <laughs> yeah you're I think you're gonna write that counselor Burke. I'm not gonna <laughs> I, I, I'm making the request I'm not gonna write the response to my request because it's not <laughs> mine yeah I think there's yeah go ahead there is one document, Councillor Berkman, which is the mayor's executive order about reviewing use of force incidents, and the HR director is formally included in that in that specific process. Send it our way, please. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for the great presentation, Karen. Uh, appreciate it. No doubt we'll continue to be in touch. Um, Again, I'm mindful of the time and the library's closure and are needing to give ourselves some buffer to uh, wrap up things here. I think we lost Councillor Paul as well, who was online uh, <laughs> to potentially talk about CNA. So Councillor Hightower, I think to the extent um, we have some time to discuss it, I think it perhaps falls on you and sort of defer to you as to the best way to do this. But with the limited time we have, I'm wondering if there's a way to perhaps frame your know-how on CNA and Talitha Consultants in the context that you've been looking for here, which is sort of how it should 
um, direct the discussion of our committee. But I completely defer to you in the best way to approach it. Great. So I have to admit that because Karen said she was willing to help, but that I was willing to move to Lisa, I was mostly ready to talk about the Talitha report, but I feel like the CNA report in many ways is the more important, not, well, I just don't think it's such a great job, but, um, but I, so I'll cover, I'll try to cover both. Uh, well, it's 7.34 right now, and I mean, I, <laughs> I, this may need more time. I don't know. I mean, is 10 minutes enough time, Zora, or for now? Yeah. Okay. I am, I, I'm going to say one of the briefer Right, so I'll start with the CNA report just because, um, and I will say, Mila probably at this point maybe knows the, um, the report better than I do, so uh, feel free to <laughs> jump in with anything that you want. Um, so, I'll, so I'll basically just go over the key findings of the report, and I really encourage folks to look at the report itself because it is, I think it's very good. There are a lot of recommendations, um, but I think it gives a good sense of um, where we are. And so I think the first finding essentially is that disparities exist. We'll just end there. The second finding is it, that there does not seem to be bias in terms of its geographic and socioeconomic um, how the department responds to geographic and socioeconomic things. The third thing is that EPD's community engagement and outreach is um, under-resourced and generally lacking, um, which leads to a lack of trust. Um, we are not following best practices when it comes to um, training, so if there's some topics that are not covered, not required, or covered insufficiently, um, especially a lot of things around internal affairs are tracking investigatory process and timeline for resolution for citizen complaints, some of which we've addressed, which we've talked about here, um, is Again, not in line with best practice, nor does it follow progressive discipline. Um, then, of course, PPP has declining morale, um, and there's general frustration around the lack of consensus around what BPD should be doing, um, and a lot of mixed mixed desires. Then we had the number of sworn officers, which was addressed by the city council resolution in terms of in terms of what they think was the ideal number. So those are the last two recommendations, or the last two, the last two findings. The recommendations were um, that something should be, some calls for service should be transitioned to CSOs and CSLs, which is the thing we've done. Um, then again, a staffing plan to <coughs> our shifts with the 70 something officers that we've authorized. Um, capturing better data, especially around traffic stops. Um, so that capturing better data, and then number four is BPD could consider a possibility that is very found or driven by bias. Number five, is investigating use of force incidences more thoroughly and again consider that the possibility that the disparities are driven by bias. Um, prior, number six is prioritize the review um, of department policies. So that's a lot of the work that um, in the following CNA report that Karen sent to folks, kind of like what we should be doing um, around policies. And then having a commitment, and then seven is establishing a community mental health advisory committee. So that's the CNA report. I 
really just read the executive summary, which I had to encourage everybody to read through anyway. Um, but I think I won't I won't summarize it any further. But I, that that was the CNA report, which I encourage folks to look at. And I'm also happy to answer any questions around it. And then the um, the Talitha report was a lot of community engagement, and they focused on three questions, which I'm not necessarily sure are the right questions, but it's what does the state and health community mean to you? What are the three most important actions in the effort to make a safer and healthier community? And is around VPD is the current public input process in the form of common suggestions and concerns easy to access and understand? And I guess to focus on some key highlights, um, the, of all the things that folks asked us to have additional investments in, so this is a much broader look, right? So and beyond BPD, so it's much more on public safety, um, so maybe less into the conversation we're talking about now, but of all the things that folks asked us to invest in across the board, didn't matter what you were, was mental health emergencies, which is indicative of that this was, you know, done after the start of COVID, I think especially. Um, and then residents, really when they thought about what made a safe and healthy community, they talked about sidewalks, speeding, vandalism, and housing affordability. Business owners talked about public urination, gentrification, vandalism, and housing affordability. So that's just something to know. Um, some, I guess one of the interesting things of talking about satisfaction with 9 11 response, 80% of people were satisfied or extremely satisfied out of 439. The biggest predictor of how satisfied folks are with a 9 11 response is home ownership and income. Um, so that's something for us to note. Um, and then there was something else that I meant to pull in terms of like how much folks trust the different services. And folks especially trust EMS is the most trusted service at 59%. Then the fire department, which ties with friends and family at 46%, and then police officers at 42%. So that's just some very high level context from the Toledo report for our discussion. Thanks, Soraya. Uh, yeah, that was good. Uh, you tap, just tap the screen. Uh, the oh, no. report, um, it is something that needs to be read. I mean, there is no way. It would literally take hours to review. It did take hours. So what am I talking about? It took, it took meetings once a week that were at minimum two hours for like a month, month and a half to review and prioritize. Um, a sign who is going to be working on it, you know, policy reviews with the police commission, um, other types of things, how to be worked on within the department. Uh, it is really, um, it's expansive, and I just, I, I just believe everyone who's involved in this process has to read it. The, uh, the summary doesn't do it justice. I think it's important to see. Um, what they were, what they were talking about, and once again, that term, uncomfortable truths. We hit these uncomfortable truths that set up this this wall between making progress. So, uh, one of the things that I found the most frustrating about it was like, hey, I don't have this stuff. I know what the experiences were, people in the community. Um, we know that people don't feel like they're police equitably. Um, and uh, that that shows the different responses of uh, the different neighborhoods, uh, and as uh, Zura just said, issues of uh, home ownership and income. Um, this is people's experiences that they talked about um, and continue to talk about. So um, I'll just leave it there. I just can't stress enough. It's really important for someone who's not deep into the CNA report to to do the digging, to look at it see what was suggested, to read the contract, to see what contract we ended up with, um, because there were a number of items related to the contract, and it, 
you know, we toured community oversight and we just didn't get some of those items. So now we're locked into another contract in 2025. And, yeah, we did the best we could. And that's, that's, that's going to kind of hinder our process too, because we're going to have this contract that doesn't have best practice on some items. And that's going to affect what we, what we can do, I think. Thank you. And just to, I know that I was like, I'm not, I wasn't crazy about telling that's a consultancy, but there is, I still encourage reading the report. I don't feel like this is more the facilitator and the economist of me being like, it's not clear, like how much of their data is like statistically significant and like they don't, they just didn't really, I think it's not as good a report as the night report, but they also have all of the raw data from all of the things that they got in there. So it's a good, if you have the time, it's also just, like, I don't think that they did a great job of summarizing it, but there's a lot of information in there, so. The raw data is very interesting because this is the responses from the public. It's the responses from people who came to the community engagement. And I think, I, I definitely had issues with the final report as well. I think they got overwhelmed. Uh, first of all, our community uh, already blew them away with a much higher than average response rate. Um, response rates for these things are, are generally low. Um, and I thought our response rate was low, but apparently it was much higher than they were accustomed to seeing. And the diversity of the comments from people made it very hard to do, just do these general categories and um, that may have been overwhelming. I mean, I'm, I'm just speculating on that part, but the raw data is, is interesting because I, I was at those engagements and I've also, I've spent a lot of time with the raw data. Thank you. I'm, I, I don't mean to cut the conversation short, but I'm mindful of uh, the library and the need to get out here. And also we have Channel 17 here and I know they need some time to uh, pack up before the library closes. But are there any other counselors that have comments on this agenda item? I was just, um, and I, it's been a while since I have read it, but wanting to know if there were sort of in the engagement of this process, things directed specifically as recommendations or best practice around the discipline process uh, and the, the current or future. Did, and I'm, I guess I'm directing that to both of you who work or are more familiar. Yeah, well, it's not just, once again, it's not just uh, discipline, it's the oversight, too. Uh, we've concentrated a lot tonight on discipline, but the meat of it, is, and I understand everyone needs to understand yeah. the discipline process, but it oversight is the meat of the issue, and, um, it, and then a lot of the recommendations um, refer to that. And um, I just think it's, it's important reading for anyone who's interested in our, our department. I, I think it is. I think that sometimes people don't understand. Um, I get questioned a lot about opinions. Of, uh, 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 and not even opinions. It's like, oh, well, that's your opinion. No, it's not my opinion. It is what it is. It's not an opinion. Um, and, and reading that report helps, helps people understand. Can, can we get the can we get both those reports posted as part of the next agenda and then everybody has got the opportunity and for those of us who have seen them and have lost them we can get them again for those of us who have never seen them we can get them for those of us who are so familiar with them we just pull them right up that would be helpful that yes do you, do you have ready you. access to those Kim yeah, yeah okay great yeah. I don't know if it's time. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, it is. But just on that point, just I always mentioned in the last meeting about the idea of having a website specifically dedicated to the, like, the workflow of this, this um, committee that the public can easily access and know when the meetings are, um, and be able to see the recordings and access these documents. I also imagine, like, in a wonderful process of um, the high power mentioning, where there's very specific things where we want to spend the of our time and feedback from the community. That could be a 
we go. Or at least we're, yeah, well, the, we, we started also with like the new Civic, so we're working with Scott about how to do all this, so yes. Great, do you, do you have a rough sense of when you might uh, get um, a product? I don't, I will talk to Joe tomorrow, let me know, please don't work on that. Okay. I, I think that most importantly is getting clarity about when it could be up in relationship to this whole process. So some information is much better than none. So it's almost 10 of. I know other folks may have questions or comments, but I, I do think we probably need to wrap if you're in agreement. I am. I okay. think that you and I can, can meet and uh, figure out how to make uh, the next meeting very productive. Okay. Um, are there any other comments from counselors, sort of other business or thinking about the next meeting? We could also email Gene and I about it as well. Just um, you do the less and. Uh, yeah, I'll send an email about around. I just received Joan's responses, okay. so I think we have some dates that we okay. may be able to settle on for next meetings. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Well, that's also uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, Councilor Grant, I was going to reach out to you actually separately to see if you had any specific documents about the New Haven model that you could send along to the committee. We could post those materials as well. Yeah, I've been, um, I can put something together. I've been sending um, a little bit ago, I had sent uh, Commissioner Sabino some information after that event at Flynn, and um, one of the speakers, I can't remember the last name, the first name is Tracy, but she uh, serves on the New Haven Police Commission, and she also served on uh, the committee uh, that produced uh, the pillars of um, Obama's 21st century policing. Um, so she was extremely interesting, um, and I think I mentioned before, after the event, so many people walked up and said, oh, why can't we do that? And I was like, well, you just voted against it. So it's really um, important, and I found like how they codify what they do now. New Haven is a nice example because they're a New England uh, city. They are bigger than we are, um, but still a smaller size city. But they have a separate commission and a separate oversight body. But I will organize the links a little bit better. I also found their minutes to be really interesting. Reading. Uh, for example, they when they review a complaint, they give the report to the complainant. So even if their report is the department's report, the complainant sees what uh, the oversight body discussed. They also discuss these things in, in open meetings. They do not mention the name of the complainants. They do not mention the name of the officers but they um, review the incidents. So there's a lot of things that um, were, there's a lot of things that claims are made that, oh, nobody does that. Well, it's actually not true this particular. And they help with hiring. The commission helps with hiring. Uh, they work with the hiring. Office. It's very interesting. So I will get something together and I'll uh, this into the whole, um, Council and uh, for any of the public attendees, if you're interested in getting the information, you can send me an email at mpgrand at burlingtonbt.gov, and I'd be happy to send you copies of that information as well. Right. You can also Google uh, New Haven uh, Police Review Board, which I just did, and it pops up. And so, great. We should take a look at it. Yeah, great. I did a lot of that. I'm sorry, Milo. I'm sorry to. I'm sorry to cut it short, Milo. But we 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 really have to get out of the library. So, um, I'm sorry to cut it short. Um, no, no. I was just going to say I'm working at the Google link, so I can ah. get those links and save people some time. Google great. So Thank you so much, Milo. Um, is there any other business from folks in the committee? I move to adjourn. All right, second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Uh, that clock is fast on the screen, actually, so we have a few more minutes. <laughs> At 7.53, so thank you.